All right, let's get started. This is the moment Caesars. Be afraid of the enormity of the possible. But what is possible? Well, I'm very inspired by the idea of the adjacent possible that Stephen Johnson wrote about in his book, Where Good Ideas Come From. And he says that the adjacent possible is like a shadow future that hovers over the present state of things. The adjacent possible is like a map of all the ways in which the present can reinvent itself. And I find myself in love with this idea because it implies a sort of built-in optimism in how we see the world. It implies a sort of different way of looking at things that will not be held back, that cannot be bound by what is, but is instead always asking the question, can we remix, can we reinvent, can we transform the material properties of the present to bring into being our imagined visions, our virtual models of what might be. And this is kind of what it means to be human. We render ourselves into the story of the world. We shape it, we create delightful future possibilities. And today, more than ever, with the rise of nanotechnology, biotechnology, and the internet of things, we have this great creative power that we've never really had before. And that's kind of amazing, and looking forward to the future is brilliant, but I kind of wanted to talk about how we got here by going all the way back and looking at some of the very first technologies that humans developed. And I don't think there's a more fitting place to start than talking about fire. Fire is like the original human technology. And if you ask the internet and do a little bit of research, you'll find that around 400,000 years ago is when man took technological control of fire. And this is a very stressful time in the life of human beings. We're hunting, we're gathering. We have to spend a huge amount of energy to even find the food. And when we do, it takes a huge amount of energy for us to be able to even digest it. And this is where fire comes in. Fire, the act of cooking food, acts as a kind of pre-digestion. It literally reduces the amount of energy your body needs to use to consume food. But what's so amazing about this is this technology actually changes the course of human evolution. The biological makeup of our bodies was changed over hundreds of thousands of years by the fact that we were able to cook food, making it easier to digest. So at the time, Homo sapiens has another problem beyond just hunting, gathering, and eating, which are these people, the Neanderthals. The Neanderthals are around at the same time as what is now known as modern man. And they're really screwing with us. They're trying to steal our babies, our food, our wood, basically everything that we have. And so, as it turns out, when you have fire, you can make weapons and see in the night and do things that you're otherwise unable to do. And so the point is this. Fire is a technology which literally disrupted the course of human evolution. Imagine if your next API could do that. It's a technology of 400,000 years. Imagine if your next startup lasted for that long. So that's fire. And let's move three orders of magnitude closer to the present day and talk about nautical navigation in the 1700s. Now, in the 1700s, being able to navigate a boat from point A to point B is literally the most important thing for some countries. It drives war, it drives trade, it drives diplomacy. It's basically the internet of that era. And in order to navigate nautically at that time, you need two things. You need a map, and you need to know your latitude and longitude, where you are in the world. And we don't have GPS, and we don't have really many other ways of doing it, so we have to invent navigation. And at the time, 
to determine your latitude, your north-south position, it's really easy. All you need is a sextant and it, for it to be nighttime. Because the way you determine your north-south position with a sextant is you point it at the north star and you take the angle to the horizon, which is what a sextant is for. And that angle is precisely and exactly your latitude number. Latitude, the north-south position, is an angle around the Earth, and it turns out that because of some like very weird maths, like those things align exactly. But longitude, your east-west position, that turns out to be a real problem. And in fact, calculating a longitude of a ship in the 1700s is so difficult that the British government passes this law known as the Longitude Act, setting up a prize for what is the equivalent of millions of pounds worth of money in today's currency if anyone can work out a method for quickly determining, determining the longitude of a ship. And this is why. The, time for the method at the time for computing the longitude of a ship is called the lunar distance method. And it's a giant pain. In order to work out where you are from east to west, you basically need to compute the offset between the moon and the, uh, the known position of a certain star. But the problem is the apparent radius of the moon changes. And the moon is actually also not moving across the sky plane at the same rate as the stars. So you need to account for chromatic aberrations and then plug it into this equation here. Or wait, no, is it that one? all while your boat is rocking around and moving. And you don't have a calculator, by the way. God, no. You have an almanac of cosine tables, 500 pages of finely computed calculations. And you have to do all of this on a boat in the night while it's rocking up and down. It would take a skilled sea captain somewhere like four hours to compute that position, with sometimes quite a lot of error. And if you get that wrong, then you crash into some rocks and die. So there is another method for computing your east-west position that's quite simple. The sun is setting on 15 degrees of the Earth every hour continuously every day. 360 divided by 24, you get 15. So why didn't they just use the current time, you might ask? Well, in the 1700s, this is what a clock looks like. It's based on a pendulum. And pendulums don't work if you're on a boat that's rocking back and forth, that's falling over, that's filling up with water sometimes. And so at the time, the British intelligentsia, the people who are deciding this longitude prize, basically declare that they believe nobody will ever solve it by the timing method. And then this guy comes in. This is John Harrison. He's a clockmaker. And he learns about this prize when he's 22 and decides to start making clocks that might work at sea. And it takes him seven years, but this is what he comes up with. It's a clock, looks like this, works at sea. It works so well that on a voyage from London to Barbados, it loses three seconds. And the captain of the ship is like, you've basically won the prize, congratulations. But John's a bit of a perfectionist, and he's not happy. So he goes away and spends another 13 years <laughs> inventing this, which is the analog, the earliest analog of the modern pocket wristwatch. And then, when he comes to claim the prize, he goes to the people who are awarding it. They're like, no. We like the lunar distance method better. We don't accept this. So they put a bunch of bureaucratic hurdles in his way. They make him disassemble his watch in front of a panel of experts, including rival clockmakers. They make him submit all of his design diagrams in public. They make him waive his patent rights, and so on, and so on, and so on. But, you know, you spend 45 years of your life building this thing only to have it hurdles put in your way, that could be really annoying. But I think today John Harrison would be vindicated because timing-based navigation is essentially one of the most powerful modern tools we have for navigation. It's what powers GPS. Many satellites use it in combination with optical methods. It's very powerful. So those are the technologies of the past. They're stories of taking 
large amounts of time to build things very carefully, and they're still, to some degree, all in use today. Let's talk about the Internet of Things. So this is the Revolve Home IoT Hub. This is a NABSA tag, and this is the little printer. All three of these devices share something in common, and it's that aside from a community of very driven uh, hackers, they essentially don't function anymore. The companies that originally created them, for whatever reason, no longer operate the platforms that back them. These technologies are essentially plus or minus a bunch of creativity bricks. And I'm not blaming the people who created them. This is not their fault. But you do have to ask, what are the conditions that make this possible? What are the conditions that make this acceptable? And I think at least one is that in the industry, we have a really strong shipping focus. We're all focusing on getting that next release out, doing the minimum viable product, hitting that next venture capital round, whatever it might be. And another way of saying this is that we have momentary focus. We're thinking about the right now, the next six months, the next 12 months, maybe two years out. But unlike John Harrison and unlike earlier technologies, we're not thinking far, far into the future. It's become far too easy for us to just build something, ship it, and then forget about it. And with software, that seems kind of fine because it's such a temporary thing. But if we're starting to put physical things in people's homes, maybe those need to work for a longer period of time. So you know how people are always saying, seize the moment? Well, I've kind of been thinking that it's the other way around. The moment seizes us. So, so that's, that's all the, the real talk uh, that I have, but uh, I just wanted to quickly talk a little bit about uh, my company. I work for DigitalOcean. Uh, if you've not heard of us, we're a cloud hosting provider. Um, and today, I'm pretty excited to be able to talk about one of our new programs called Hatch. Uh, Hatch is like an acceleration program for startups with DigitalOcean. If you're working with certain uh, VCs or accelerators, you can get anywhere between $10,000 and $100,000 credit towards your account. If you're thinking about doing a startup, please do come and talk to me about this. It's pretty cool. I just wanted to say a huge thank you to James for inviting me back this year. Uh, where is James? Is he even in the room? Oh, he's up there. Hi, James. I love you. Thank you so much. Um, and to sort of keep the love going, uh, if you don't yet have a DigitalOcean account, you can sign up with code thingmonk15 to get a $15 credit. That's for all of you, because we love you. Um, so that's all I've got. Thank you so much for listening. I'm Sam Fippin on all the parts of the internet. If you would like to email me, it's sfippin at do.co. Uh, thank you very much.